So now you've got that patient kind of cruising along, and let's make it an idea. It's often a little old lady, and she's gone on for six, seven months often with a fluoropyrimidine and Bev, um, and her CEA goes from six to 10, and so you scan mm -hmm. her, and her, you know, her two centimeter tumor now is 2.3. Um, so, and, and uh, you know, and so, but, so now what? She's completely asymptomatic. She's not in any trouble, but she's progressing on your regimen. Back to ox, add Erie, tweak your fluoropyrimidine. What are you doing, honey? So, so I think this is a very, very good example because I think what we call progression is has completely different dimensions. When you ha when we have effective treatment and we shrink a tumor which was five centimeter to one and it grows three millimeters, technically it's progression of disease, but we know it's not. So I think PFS and PFS may not be the same depending on the effectiveness of the treatment in the first place. Obviously in your case, we would continue. Yes. I think you need to have a clinically meaningful progression in order to switch or go back to the original drug you have if you don't have the toxicity limiting you or switch to another combination. But, uh, and you know, the question is, can, should it be five millimeters? Should it be one centimeter? I think we can, but it has to be in a significant growth. And the smaller the lesions are in the beginning, the more problematic is this calling progression of disease. Yeah, and, and to some degree, this is a nervous patient or not. If she says, I want to, I, I know, let's get back mm -hmm. on, well, maybe you do and talk If it's many millimeters, I don't think they have yeah, a problem. Yeah, you can talk her down yeah. from that. You can talk her down for another two months or so. Yeah. But I think also outside of a BRAF mutated patient, I mean, this is not small cell lung cancer. People aren't going to hopefully explode within right. a two-month time period. And I think Axel even showed some data where new lesions, even tiny new lesions in an asymptomatic patient may not really... Correct. Tell us that we should change our treatment. We are not treating the CT scan, we are treating the patient. And not the CA in particular, because yeah. a lot of physicians and patients are, you know, look at this one number, this measurable number, you know, and they correlate their whole life with it. I, it the number of second opinions I get in this patient, oh. they've not done a scan. All the, C, the CEA's gone up to 10, and so they rush them into our clinics, and I'm like, really? Yeah, <laughs> no, no, I, and I think that's a good point maybe also for, for the audience is like, don't treat the CEA, because I see sometimes they're switching treatment based on the CEA alone. I think that may actually take away effective treatment too early. So we've entered now into what I'll call the third most difficult area in, in colon cancer in general, and that is sequence of therapies, lines of therapy. And to really drill down on this, I think it might be most useful for us to go through some of the key clinical trials that emerged over the last uh, year or so, so that everybody's on the same page. Um, the new drugs, uh, mm. so let's describe those trials, the TML, Bev Beyond Progression studies, and then kind of circle back and do a few cases, if you will, and say, when do you change to what, KRAS wild type uh, or not? So Axel the correct clinical trial. Let's start from last line and work backwards. Last line. Uh, tell us about this trial and give us uh, really your five minute overview, uh, two minute overview. Of, of this <laughs> two minute trial. over, yeah. So uh, the correct style, uh, trial was a phase three study in a patient population that had received all standard components of therapy, fluoroprimidine, oxaplot, and renotec, and uh, bevacizumab, and KRAS, and KRAS wild-type tumors, cetuximab, or panitumab. But so both those, were eligible, wild types uh, and yes, mutated tumors. Yes, both were eligible, but patients were really in a situation which we see quite commonly, especially in larger referral centers. You know, what do you do now? What do you do now? And, you know, in real honesty, we have no data that anything's better than best supportive care. Okay. So, actually, we designed this study using regorafenib, this new drug, which is a multi-kinase inhibitor, affecting a lot of different... Uh, you know, factors that could influence tumor progression like angiogenesis, but also intracellular pathways. And we designed a study using a regorafenib against best supportive care with placebo control in a two-to-one randomization. And, you know, it's interesting when we, there are certain interesting parameters to the study. When we designed the study, there was some uh, criticism, you know, do you really think you can enroll patients to a placebo-controlled trial in a last-line study in the United States and anywhere in the world? So we kind of blunted this effect by two-to-one randomization, so two out of three patients had a chance to get the drug. And no crossover. No crossover, no crossover, FDA mandated because overall survival was the endpoint. And uh, then we, we thought, yeah, it's still a difficult trial to enroll. We had 690 patients projected in 26 months. We enrolled 760 patients in 10 months. Mm -hmm. So 16 months ahead of schedule, mm -hmm. which I always put up as a uh, kind of sign, this is an unmet need population. And you know, patients are willing 
to get into these and trials. And they're well. And, Ooh, and they actually, I mean, well. we have a lot of patients who go through these lines and lines of therapy. The average colon cancer patient, you know, might not necessarily be symptomatic from the mm. disease. And so we enrolled these patients very rapidly. It sort of overwhelmed our system, more or less. It was just incredible enrollment. And fortunately, the trial was positive. Mm. And uh, with a hazard rate for overall survival of 0.77, which is 23 production of death events, um, PFS curve is interesting because it might imply that there is a group of What do you of mean imply? It screams it. Uh, yeah, it screams it. Yeah, okay, yeah. I should. Yeah, it screams what? A, the biomarker. There's a sub -subset. Bi some subset. It looks very much like cetuximab before we knew about KRAS. Yeah, so it's really, it's, the curves are actually overlapping, perfectly identical. It's screaming that there is a subset of patients that really doesn't benefit. So we're actively looking at the biomarker or biomarker signature right now, which can identify patients. So about 40% of patients benefit, 44 40, or something 45%, like that, disease control rate. Yeah, exactly. So a subset's clearly pulling out. Yep. Describe a little bit response rate toxicity. You know, it's definitely not a drug that can induce a response. I mean, this is uh, similar to actually data we've seen here with rambucirumab and gastricans. Actually, the curves and everything looks very much the same. No response, really but a clear impact on delaying tumor progression, which is probably what we can expect in a last line setting. Because we talked about what are these tumors, what are these tumors comprised of stem cell characteristics. You don't really get rid of the bulk of the tumor. Yeah. But you know, and I think the highlight is controlling the disease. Um, so it's not a, a drug where you can expect, you know, shrinking the tumor and pulling a patient away from a death bed, you know, by, from tumor load. Uh, side effects were, uh, like a lot of multi-kinds inhibitor skin reaction, which is an issue. We need to be very careful. We kind of hand patients a jar of uh, lotion uh, and, uh, and uh, diarrhea, fatigue, anorexia. So things we've known to live with in, with sorafenib, which is very related to uh, regorafenib, sunitinib, and other kinds. So of really important to coach our patients through that. Well, very much We'll so. get back to toxicity management in a minute. I think that's a, and this is a, a real challenge that we don't have a drug that is inducing a response, but is you know controlling disease, because if if you have a patient who is suffering from the disease and give this patient toxic but effective chemotherapy, the patient will become better. These patients are not really becoming better. They're yeah? staying where they are. They're staying where they are, and they have the additional toxicity that is coming from regorafenib. So I think we have to learn very much how to best use the drugs beside the molecular subgrouping of these patients. Yeah. I think that's a big challenge. And I think a lot of our patients have been waiting for this drug, at least in the United States, so their PS was falling while they waited. Right. Whereas when we now that the drug's out there and new patients are being eligible, it might be a better PS patient going into yeah. the study. And the drug's being treatment. moved into earlier lines of therapy. I mean, what we talked about earlier, I mean, could this be in a maintenance therapy, for instance? Yeah. Or you know, dosing, you know. We need to be careful with that because we, we need to test it. Is it better going to be in refractory? And it's clearly, and it's clearly off, what we, when you talk about maintenance, it would be off-label, of course. And yeah, I'm not know. sure whether the dose of 160 milligram is the right dose because yep. we have a lot of patients where we have to reduce this. Yeah, very high level of dose. So it's a very high level, so there's a big challenge of uh, the, the, you know, to yeah. further develop this treatment. Yeah. yeah. But it's so good to have something. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I'm happy. New yeah. tool, we're excited. To me, it's yep, going to teach us about colon cancer. And, and really an exciting, exciting new medicine. And I think um, this is a wonderful data set when you look at response and PFS, the medians, mm -hmm. don't tell anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be cautious when we read this data. We have to look at the hazard ratio more and more to really see what the benefit is because we do not capture with the usual numbers, the median numbers, the benefit of a drug.